I got glass of time. <laughs> Nick, no Robbie, no football Everybody players. get ready to take notes. I got some more AC stories here. And uh, everybody needs to know what you're looking at when you run into something like this. Uh, the Buick AC, this is, a, this is an AC that, this is what we did here, you know, sometime back. Uh, this 93 Buick, big old Park Avenue, all the bells and whistles. Had this fancy, you know, display on it. And uh, it was a, you know, two ton, uh, two zone deal and all that. AC was blowing nothing but hot wind. And the AC compressor wasn't engaging. So that's what we do. You know, what we first do is we make sure the compressor is engaging. If it's, you know, we want to make sure that uh, to begin with, if the compressor is engaging, we're going to be filling the suction line. We see if it's cold all the way to the compressor. We know it's got plenty of refrigerant charge still blowing hot air. We're looking somewhere else for a problem in the way of air management, blend door, something like that. So I wanted to know whether the system had refrigerant in it, if there was what kind of refrigerant was there. And it was originally equipped with R12, and the outside port was one of these oddballs that you had to have a special adapter. You could just, you know, put any kind of a, in other words, you had to adapt that little bitty one up to this one right here. So. That adapter was one that we had got when we were working on Cadillac, you know, a while back. So I got that in my desk drawer. But it said, fail this R12 system. This was a system with R12 fit fittings that had 100% 134 in it. Now tell me why it was a good idea to identify it. Because if it's R12 fittings, you cannot assume it's got R12 in it. I saw that twice. I saw it on one car that belonged to the college that came, was here when I already came here. It was an old Taurus we had. When I checked that one with the refrigerator and the fire, it had R12 fittings. 134. If I'd have pulled that into my machine on my, the R12 side of my machine, I'd have trashed the R12 side of, R12 side of the machine that had trash gas in it. We don't want that. Now, with that oddball high side fitting, my normal part supplier couldn't provide me with a retrofit part, one way or another. The process at the center of this system is HVAC programmer. That's what they call the, the module that the program that takes in the inputs and decides, you know, it interfaces with the engine controller and all that. Receives electrical input signals from the heater and AC control. Receives input from the passenger temperature control panel, two solar sensors, an ambient temp sensor, an in-car temp sensor, as well as blower control module, PCM, and both the driver passenger mix actuators. This is a very simple system. It's easy to understand, right? Okay. The CPU and the HVAC unit untangles all that data, feeds coherent output signals, control AC compressor clutch operation via relay under the hood, air discharge location, vacuum servos, discharge temperatures, via reversible DC air mix blower motors with Potentiometer feedback, and last but not least, lower speed. Okay? They made it simple, right? The schematic is six pages long. But, let's not get bogged down. Let's just start simple. What we're going to do, we focused on the compressor, because while there was good refrigerant pressure, and we deal with that at the end, it wasn't running. Should be running. All right. This right here is fairly simple. PCM, basically, you know, it interfaces with the HVAC and it turns that on and your AC clutch. You remember what this diode's here for, you electrical folks? Whenever you de-energize this compressor clutch, it acts like an ignition coil. All of that magnetism slaps across those windings and makes a 400 volt spike. So it just and keeps it from going back? Keeps it from going back and destroying something. I've seen it burn things up before. I told you the story about one that burned up a radio on a bucket truck because they were using an AC style clutch to run their PTO. They didn't put a clamping diode. Well see whenever the whenever the uh, voltage is going in, it can't go this way because that's like a one-way valve. Yeah. However, whenever it uh, that releases, it causes that magnetism, I mean that, that spike to chase its tail until it goes away. That's what that's a clamping diode is what it is. Keep it from spiking. Uh, starter relays well some of the Ford trucks had uh, clamping diodes built into them so they wouldn't I got one one time, somebody had put a starter relay on an Aerostar, it didn't have a clamping diode built into it, and you'd crank it several times, and sometimes it would run good and sometimes it wouldn't. And it turned out it was because I noticed it had a new starter relay, and I hooked a scope up to it, and whenever you disintegrate the starter relay, a spike would, whoo, and it would go back into the engine controller and make it go wacky. Uh, but anyway, once, once again, you see me do this again and again and again this semester. This is the best way to do this, and we're kind of doing it on that truck out there right now. We pull the compressor clutch relay, we basically didn't measure any ground right here. Now before, when we talked about it, we had bad clutch calls, right? In this particular case, uh, we did not have that. What we had here was this situation. We had, somehow the harness had moved too close to the serpentine belt, and it had cut the ground wire. It was grounded in the pressure. See that? And so basically what we were going to do 
Well, it actually cut this wire and it damaged that one too, is what it amounted to. And at this time I had a girl in here that had small hands like you, and I had her down there working those, you know, way down in that hole. She had to do all that work, and she did a good job of it. And basically what we did was we soldered all that mess back together, we tie wrapped this harness back up out of the way. It was supposed to actually go inside that heater hose. I mean, that, I'm sorry, that uh, radiator hose. But somebody had run it out here. You can see how it was probably supposed to go inside there. But we just tied it back because it went on the rainy cooling system and all that kind of stuff. We were kind of under the gun in a hurry on that one. We got it going, and that was, you know, working really good then, but we needed to deal with this other problem. But what I did was I screwed this silly nonsense out of here, and then I got the right kind of fitting from GM, and I screwed it down in there, and we wound up with, an R, with R34 fittings, and this has already been converted. And when they convert one from R12 to R134, you know, the oil for R12 is not compatible with 134. So if you just leave the same oil in there, it burns up compression. And you can't go that route. But anyway, somebody had already done the oil thing, apparently. So we wound up with new fittings in both places, and last little capped off 134 fittings. We had, con you know, converted the fittings, even though the car had already been converted to 134. Or in the early days when they were selling conversion kits, they wanted to, you know, sell you a high pressure cutout switch and some more wiring and all that. And uh, I wonder what they were called. Well, once in 1979, this guy came to me that I worked with, and he said, my AC's not cooling, so I disconnected the low pressure cutout switch, you know, the one on the accumulator, uh, that whenever the pressure goes below 24 pounds, it cuts off the compression. Uh, I just jumpered it with that, and then the compression, the air conditioner got cold and all that. And I said, this switch is burned out, because that was fairly common in those days. And I, he said, well, no, he said, $65. He said, what? <laughs> you just jump on the wire. I said, yeah, but I knew which wire to jump. So you know, a lot of times we get paid for what we know, not what we do, right? I, didn't, I was kidding. I didn't really charge him anything. But it was a truck like that one right there. That wasn't him, by the way. All right. So this other one's got a link in here. When I hit a bump, the blower motor switches to high blow. So I drove it. Boom. Oh. High blow. What? What's up with this? And so I, I got the, uh, I opened the hood. And I got a uh, long extension I had, you know, for pulling transmissions out. And I bumped the AC blower uh, controller down there, which is where the blower resistor goes and the one that doesn't have automatic temperature control. This one had. I bumped it, and when I bumped it, it went to high blow. And so I thought, aha, this has got to be a bad part, you know? I mean, why else? Bumping it might go to high blow. Hey, come on. So I, I went to Lincoln dealership, had them send us down a $100 controller, and I put that sucker in there. And I bumped that one and went to high blow too. What? This is the new one. How is this possible? And then I got to check it on this darn thing. And it was the, the controller, you know, basically closed the little relay in the one that on that particular car. It was not exactly like it, but the long and short of it, it had a relay for high blow. It was built in. And there was eight volts leaking out of the control head, feeding the coil on that relay. It wasn't enough to pull it in, but as it was enough to where it bounced in, it would stay in. So that's why when you bumped it, see? So this thing here was being told by this 8 volt. So I basically got a 150 ohm resistor and shunted the 8 volts to ground on that circuit so that it could still use the high blow, but it wouldn't bounce really close. And I, thought, Man, I don't want to tell a guy you need a $400 control head off and put a $100, you know. And that was all wrong with it. Uh, so the right way to do it was replace the control head, you know. Of course, nowadays on Lincoln Edo, we probably wouldn't find a control head this side of eBay. All right, the 83 diesel rabbit. Uh, the VW diesel rabbits could have, could have some good AC, but when the compressor kicked in, it felt like you lost about half your horsepower. Uh, compressor would pull enough off of the engine to where it would hunker down. And the way a diesel like this is, you better have pedal of the metal when you're going into a load situation or it'll hunker down. And so this was my car and I needed something to change. I said, I don't have to turn off the air conditioner every time I need to pass a car. You know, it's terrible. <laughs> now, there is a trick that I learned from uh, the guy at the Volkswagen School when I was working at the dealership. Um, he said, you can uh, set the, uh, do your valve adjustment. He said, set the uh, intake valves as tight as you can within specs and the exhaust valves as loose as you can within specs. And then you dial this little screw in here on the injector pump until it starts to smoke a little bit. <laughs> and uh, after I, I didn't do that on this car, but after I did it on another car I had, an old jump bomb I bought for $175 to play with, that sucker would fly. And I was thinking, man, I wish they'd known it when I was around this one, but anyway. So, but I decided to do something on this one right here. You see these two switches right here? Now this switch right here, one of them is a 70% wide open throttle switch and all that, so uh, 
I go on ahead and I and put this relay. I actually in, uh, created this schematic using Volkswagen style, you know, from the, back in the day. The rounds down here, compressor clutches here. And what I did was I fixed it so when the 70% throttle switch, which if you were 70% into the throttle, it would energize this relay. When it energized the relay, it would pull that over here and you lose your compressor. So if I was deep into it, my compressor would drop out and I'd have a little extra power. That switch was already there. All I did was take advantage of it. See, so sort of amount of it. And that's how I hooked all it up. The only reason that that switch was there was so you could use it for you. There was a shift light. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But there was a shift light on the dash when you reached a certain throttle angle and speed and all. It would turn a little orange light tell it with an arrow pointing up. Telling you it's like to shift to your next gear. I didn't need that nonsense. <laughs> they were trying to get you. You got 50 miles in a gallon, 55, whatever. Anyway, you got really good fuel economy. All right, so there's the Cherokee. Ed said the AC would cool just fine in the morning, but as the day wore on, there were times when air coming from register would warm up before it was anything but cool. So you're going to see one of these sooner or later. And here's Ed standing here next to his Jeep. And uh, he came over there. Ed was kind of a funny guy whenever he was, he was one of the Joey students over there. And he came over here one day, and he goes, he had a little car he was driving, and the bumper was kind of bent on it. And he says, can y'all take my bumper off and straighten it out. I said, no, we don't do body work here. We're not going to pull your bumper. And he says, uh, oh, come on, come on, come on. And he's trying to talk me into it. I said, Ed, that is your problem. It's not my problem. I ain't taking your bumper off and working on it. And so then he went somewhere else to take some other classes in another college. And when he came back to this one, he said, what did y'all do last semester? I said, this guy came in here with a little car and we straightened his bumper. <laughs> Ed started to get mad. I said, yeah, I'm just kidding. We didn't really do that. I just jerked your chain. He started to get his face red. You did it for him, but you would do it for me. You know? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he was kind of high strung and I was, I was messing with him. So I could feel frosty air coming from the register. You know, it was an ambient temperature. It was about 85 out like it is today. And you know, it was blowing cold. I didn't even connect the gauges. I speculated maybe the electric coolant fan wasn't working, but I used the test light method like I showed you to check the fan, and the fan was fine. I had no problem with the fan. Now, that one's got a belt driven fan and an electric fan. It's got two fans. So, one of them uh, is really, I mean, the electric was really important. All right, so, and I understand the wiring here. This system is simple and direct. PCM controls AC clutch, and he's taking air engine coolant fan through a pair of relays. And uh, the four liter package has a water pump driven fan as well as an electric coolant fan. That's what we got here. Well, let's see how these switches are wired in series. All right, so you get 12 volts coming here, coming through here, coming through here, coming through here. Long, and when you turn on your AC, that 12 volts comes through both of those switches. You might notice that this one's normally closed, that one's normally closed. This one's normally open. All right, now this is your high pressure switch, this is your low pressure switch. As long as it sees 12 volts right here, your compressor's in, right? If either one of these switches here changes states, it's going to dump the compressor. I'm thinking we need to make sure that it's not going on here. And so, in other words, if your low pressure kicks over here, even though that one may still be closed, you know, it interrupts that 12 volts. So the AC switch says the power train control might be looking for that 12 volts. Uh, there was a time when I thought the 12 volts was originating here, and this was the ground. Because they do both things on crazy steel, but this one here has got the 12 volts coming down. Because you might even notice coming from the top is going to be your voltage. All right, this one right here, when that high pressure switch kicks over, it also closes this one, and that requests a radiator fan, and the powertrain control module energizes the, the coolant fan. Whoops, I backed up. Hit two times. All right, 12 volts come through. We already showed you that. Two switches in one, and all right, I could have gone to the next one anyway. As a compressor cycle, we watch the low pressure switch change states several times. I actually had a little uh, thing that I, so it wouldn't mess up the connector. That's like a little wiper thing, you know, uh, like I have. I stuck it down in there, back probe the connector, and we had our meter against it. Uh, when there was voltage passing through the switch, the compressor was turned on, and when the voltage was interrupted, the compressor was turned off. And we watched it for about 10 minutes with a hot system and a hot engine, because that's when this happened. Finally, the compressor was cycled off, and it didn't cycle back on. Started to heat up inside the cow. That's where we were, right? All right, so when the compressor cycled off, didn't cycle back on, we found the relay was sending power to the compressor, because I checked it right here. I had it up where I could just touch that terminal one out of the compressor, and we had a nice bright light with a feed over there. What do you think the problem was? We had power going to the compressor clutch, but the compressor clutch was not engaging. 
Nope, that's a good guess, but not the right one. I've given out worksheets on this this semester to your air conditioner people. What you gonna do when you got power going to the compressor, but it's not energized, it's not pulling the clutch in? You bump this sucker. Now make sure whenever you yeah, bump it, you bump it in the direction that it's, it's going to turn gap. anyway. Yeah, it's the air gap. Yeah, I was trying to think about it. I was like, what? I, he said that like two seconds ago, and I'm sitting here trying to think about it. The air gap. You bump that, and if it kicks in, and it stays in until it cycles off the next time it doesn't cycle back on, that air gap needs to be set. Right? Um, on the GMC, to set the air gap, you got to have a tool that presses it in a little farther and pulls it out if it's too close. On most of them, there's shims. <coughs> All right. This is what you got here. Change the shims, measure the clearance. All right? You got to pull that off. Now you can do this without all these special tools. But this ain't that hard to get off. They show tools in here that you got. They claim you got to have, but you really don't have to have those tools. Get it off for most of the time. The shims go right here. And basically, if you pull that off, see this right here is showing this with without the pulley on it. That's just the compressor clutch coil. Then you bump it back on there and you use a feeler gauge to measure it. The, special weight, the, the uh, specification is 16 to 31 thousandths of an inch. And so that's what you're wanting. The vehicle was too wide. And so we set that. Everything's fine. He's going to town. All right, time for a test. Everybody get your test out. Better have something right, to write. Before we with. take this test, I saw a uh, AC clutch on the ground at a Rite Aid and Enterprise mm -hmm. on the ground in the parking lot. Yeah. Just sitting there. Yeah. I was like, oh, that looks the bad. The fact that you know what it is means that you've had some training, right? You know? oh, yeah. That looked like an AC clutch. Anyway, uh, Technician A says most of today's automotive AC units use a thermistor in the evaporator housing to prevent evaporator icing. Technician B says refrigerant pressure is directly related to refrigerant temperature. Who's correct about that? That's a kind of an old question. You could, there's a couple of different ways you can go on it. And, uh, we don't have a lot of time here, so I'm going to move on. Which would not cause the evaporator to freeze up? A step closed AC clutch relay, a step closed low pressure cutout switch, a bad fan relay, a compressor that won't shut off. One of those would not cause the compressor. Technician A says the compressor will cycle more often with the blower on low. Technician B says the vehicle will actually get better fuel economy on a long trip with AC on max or recirc than it will on norm. Who's correct? That's kind of tricky on that second part because it doesn't have the whole thing on there. Now I remember exactly what you said. Hmm. Technician A, technician B, both or neither. vehicle where the AC is blowing warm air, though the compressor is running normally, the gauges are showing these readings, and the suction line is cold all the way to the compressor, what's the most likely cause of the problem? Now this is something that, you know, if you've been doing your worksheets, you should know. Right. <laughs> uh, so just make a point? Hmm? Look at him. He put down an answer there. Don't you just love these short answer questions where it's not A, B, C, or D, but you got to actually write something down? Yeah, I did this one today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. AC not cooling, compressor running, suction line not cold. What's the most likely cause of these readings? You know how hard it was for me to draw these gauges? Y'all better appreciate this. Fully charged system. 
Compressor running. AC not cooling. What's the most likely concern with this one? Compressor running, AC starts out cooling well, then stops cooling, compressor belt starts squealing or compressor clutch starts slipping, what's the most likely cause? We fixed one of these at the end of last semester. liquid state in each hose. I even told you the names of the hoses. Suction line, liquid line, evaporator inlet, heater hoses, discharge line. But yeah. so you want us to say the liquid state of What I want you to know hose. is uh, which one of these lines up with which one of these? It's not really set up good on your worksheet. Like I say, we're going to go over this. this is, imagine what it would be like if this was your final exam and this was the only test you were going to have. That'd be pretty spooky, wouldn't it? Yeah. Ooh. Some of the tests I had with four, they had 20 questions that were spit up, put up in four groups of five questions, and if you missed three in any one group, you'd like, fail the whole test, even if you got all the rest of them right. over these. This is not a test I'm going to grade you on. I'm just giving you, give, it's a wake up call is what it is. Let me move on to the next one. We got to go back over these. Right. Name these hoses and pipes. That's really easy to do because I basically got them done for you. Get your suction line, evaporator inlet, heater hose, discharge line, is that one going from the compressor to the condenser? Then your liquid line goes and it hits the orifice tube is right there, okay? Blower doesn't, blower doesn't work on high. A, faulty blower motor relay. B, bad ground on G200. C, bad blower motor. B, I mean D, bad pitch back control window. I think somebody did this one early in the semester, I think. for a lot of time. Um, this one right here is sort of uh, subjective because there's a lot of them now have got, they're measuring the temperature of the evaporator instead of measuring low pressure uh, to cut it off. So it would be kind of hard for me to definitively say you were wrong or right if you answered this in a certain way. Refrigerant pressure is related to refrigerant temperature. <coughs> and, and a lot of them, at least half of them, uh, on, the, on the newest ones, or checking using a thermistor. I say that. I'm mean, saying that without actually taking a survey. But so this one right here, I'm not going to beat you up on. But just be aware of the fact that the low pressure cutout switch is there to prevent icing, and the expansion valve also does the same job. You know. Uh, but if, if you're measuring, a lot of them will have a little, at least have a little alcohol line stuck in the evaporator core. And if it got below a certain temperature, it's like the uh, This would not cause the evaporator to freeze up. Hey, that's two in a row. 
That would not cause an evaporator to freeze up. Everything else would. Step closed AC relay would hold a clutch all the time. Step closed low pressure cutout switch. Compressor won't shut off. All that. Technician A says the compressor will cycle more often with more on low. That is true. You turn it on max AC, roll the windows up. You want it if you're measuring, if you're finding one that's going to give you, it's giving trouble after it warms up like the one on the white Jeep we are talking about. Turn it on, let it cycle on max low, and if it, it'll, the more it cycles on and off, the more a problem is going to show up if it's going to show up when it cycles. Uh, technician B says the vehicle will actually get better fuel economy on a long trip with the AC on at max uh, than it will on uh, or max or research. And that's correct too, because it's air conditioning and same air. That's three. Pulling air in from the outside. All right, on the vehicle where it's blowing warm air, pressure running normally, what do you come up with on that? I said the blend door actuator. The blend door is actuator is likely to be where your trouble is if you've got a situation where this is looks like normal reading, right? You're pulling down to around 30, up here you're around 175. Now I will tell you that with ambient temperatures, with high ambient temperatures, these readings will be higher on both sides and lower on both sides of the lower ambient temperatures. AC not cooling, compressor running, suction line not cold. This is a weak compressor. This compressor is no good. If it's full, right, you basically got a fully charged system. You make sure that you've got everything in there you're supposed to have, and you've got a, you got low, this is high, and that's low. The compressor is supposed to pull this low and push that high. If it's not able to do it, you got issues with that. This is a fully charged system with a compressor running, AC not cooling. Most likely concern on that one, look, this is low and that's low. That's usually going to be an expansion valve that's clogged up. You got a clogged up expansion valve, it's going to do something like that. I've actually seen one though where we changed the expansion valve on a Toyota Camry one time and it didn't touch it until we went in there and replaced the evaporator. And I couldn't even find any restriction on the evaporator, but after we replaced the evaporator, uh, it cleared those pressures up and got it cooling again. Didn't expect that. Compressor running, AC starts out cooling well, but then stops cooling, compressor starts cooling, compressor clutch starts slipping. I got a video of us fixing one of those on this little Nissan truck. We put a fan in front of it, blowing more air through the condenser, and it cooled down and quit slipping the belt and all, and it turned out the fan clutch. This is the fan clutch off of that truck. So fan clutch was bad. Fan clutch. Yeah. It would never, that little spire by, by metal spring is supposed to basically change some valving on the inside and cause this to have more resistance so it more closely matches the speed of the pulley. And on that particular truck, it had to have one of those. And those little Nissan uh, trucks like that do that. Uh, somebody told me that after I posted that video, I had people say, oh yeah, every time I see one of those, I'll put a clutch on it. Uh, Wait, what if I had an electric? Got an electric fan, it could be a problem there. Or you could have a bunch of dog fennels in between your uh, condenser and your radiator keeping airflow. Anything that blocks airflow or interferes with airflow through the condenser is going to cause you to have high pressures on the high side and possibly start to wheel on the belt. Uh, so it's most likely something for condenser. It's likely, it's, a, it's got to do with airflow through the condenser. Yeah, because my mom's van has that problem where it starts squealing. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, the dog fennels and stuff will get all the way through the condenser, but they'll stop at the radio. Crazy thing. All right, so right here on the suction line, you got low pressure gas, high pressure liquid. Discharge line, you got high pressure gas, evaporator in, 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 inlet, you got low pressure liquid that's getting ready to evaporate in the evaporator, and then the heater hoses, you got coolant. And we've already named those. This one right here is going to be a blown fuse right here, or if you don't have a blown fuse right there, this leader is really burned out which is built into the blower resistor assembly. So if that fuse is blown, you will not have a high blow, but you will have every other speed on there. We got a truck out there doing that right now. One of y'all were looking at. So just remember that. Always think about that front HVAC fuse. If this is one in like 2000, 2001 Chevy pickup, they get their wired up like this. All right. What do you think? You get something? Yeah. Pretty tasteful. Yeah, I figured you'd like that.